Slido.com. Um, it's like a slide, but with a O instead of a E, Slido.com. And uh, once you're there, uh, please enter the code zero 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 seven zero seven. So once you enter the code, uh, you should see a chat room uh, somewhere that you can ask me any question. Uh, feel free to ask in English or in Mandarin, but um, uh, I'll be answering in English. So, um, and um, if you see any question, like hello here, uh, that you would like to, to press like, uh, you can also like it. Once you press like, you will see the number here which is zero, uh, become the one, two, three, and so on. Uh, and the question with the most likes will float to the top. So uh, all during my, um, like, like there's one now, uh, and then there's now a new comment, and my lecture will be structured entirely by the questions uh, and comments that you ask. Uh, if here is empty, I'll just play you some videos and, and say nothing. So uh, ask me some questions, otherwise uh, we'll just be sitting here and staring at each other. Um, and uh, um, so once I um, process a question, I'll just highlight it like this. Right? And you will note that it is anonymous, meaning that you don't have to enter your name, you don't have to raise your hand. Um, this system uh, has two modes uh, because I can uh, force you to enter your name to enter this, but whenever I do this, I, I find that there is no good questions. Everybody just asks you know, very uh, normal, harmless questions. But once it's anonymous, meaning that you don't have to identify yourself before asking, I get some really good questions. Um, so uh, please just um, ask me anything and like the question that you would also like to be answered so that uh, we can process uh, this collaboratively. And for you who do not have a cell phone, Please feel free to uh, raise your hand or don't raise your hand and start speaking anytime uh, as a conversation. And if it is too hard for you, feel free to just ask uh, a neighboring um, person uh, to enter your question for you or write it down on a sheet of paper or, or something like that. Uh, and then we'll be structuring the conversation uh, like this. Right, so so let's, let's get started. There's a lot of hellos. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, Right, and um, someone asked if this is my first time to Kaohsiung. It is not. Um, uh, I visit Kaohsiung many times uh, when I was a student, when I was a junior high school student. Uh, the science fair uh, was in Kaohsiung. I remember vividly visiting Kaohsiung for the junior high school um, science fair. And, um, and I dropped out of uh, the junior high school at the second uh, level um, after winning the science fair in Kaohsiung, so I remember that very clearly. Uh, and uh, after I become the digital minister, I visited Kaohsiung many times also, uh, one for the Fang Shi Da Shang Festival and one for the ARVR uh, building at the uh, Southern Taiwan uh, Software uh, Complex. And then, and also at the Guo I don't know how to translate this to English, uh, and, uh, um, and and so on. So there's quite a few um, digital industry related um, events here in Kaohsiung, and uh, with the uh, forward looking infrastructure special budget plan, uh, we are trying to to shape Kaohsiung into somewhere that has all the right people to develop uh, the, the virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality industry. And um, I, I do have a uh, personal um, reason to, to, to push this kind of uh, model forward, because I, I talked with uh, quite a few legislators from Belgium, and they all told me that uh, when they have to go to the legislatory building for the parliamentary inquiry meeting, for example. Um, of course, it is a lot of work for us to be sitting there saying nothing uh, during the legislature inquiry, but for the uh, MPs, for the legislators from Kaohsiung, it is extra work for them because they have to wake up like way early, like 5 a.m. or something, and take the high-speed rail all the way to Taipei, and then attending you know, the, the uh, legislative meetings, and then immediately go back to the high-speed rails and go back here because they also have their local constituents uh, to take care about. So they spend like daily uh, commuting just on TSHR and it is 
a waste of time, frankly. Uh, and so uh, one of the work that we've been doing is, of course, improving their quality of life by making sure that the iPad 1 Wi-Fi network is available during their commute so they can at least get something done uh, using a free wireless network on the high speed rails. But uh, I think to fundamentally solve this problem, we need to allow uh, more parliamentary hearings, more parliamentary uh, meetings to be able to be done in this kind of Skype or FaceTime, this kind of video conferencing way so the local legislators don't even have to travel at all for many of those meetings. I think this is a much more practical vision than moving the legislator building uh, to Taichung or to Kaohsiung. I don't think that works uh, in the near term, but if they, they can save some time traveling, I think uh, they will spend much more time on quality debates and so on. And because it's all live streamed, it's part of the, the uh, public television anyway, right? So um, I, I do hope that by making Kaohsiung one of the if not the center of the regional uh, leadership um, on AR and VR and uh, teleconferencing, we can make sure that it is, um, even though um, counting by DSHR, a lot of minutes to travel, uh, but if we got this uh, setting get into our everyday administrative uh, working system, then um, it's traveling at a, a speed of light, and when seen from a speed of light, Taiwan is a really small place. Uh, when you say something in Kaohsiung and it's transmitted over the internet to Taipei, it is just, you know, 20 milliseconds or, or something. There is almost no delay, and you can see very clearly people's facial expressions and so on. Taiwan is a very, very small place when you see from the angle of the speed of light. So that, that's uh, my, my vision for Kaohsiung, and I do, do really want to uh, help to, to make this a reality working with the local um, people. And, um, Someone reminds me to speak a little more slowly, um, and I will do exactly that. Um, so um, I will be speaking at this speed, um, unless some of you object again. Um, Jack says hi, hi Jack, um, hi Jack, um, and um, someone says it's a cool system. Sometimes says welcome to Kaohsiung, um, hello. Uh-huh. Right. Um, someone asked, is the DPO treating the government employees as enemy? I don't quite know what the DPO means. Uh, I, I'm taking it to mean perhaps the, I don't know, Democratic Progressive Party or, or something like that. Uh, would that be an educated guess? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, of course, this is a, a very uh, sensitive uh, issue right now. Um, from, from my point of view, I, I've never belonged to any political parties. I, I don't believe in political parties. I think uh, they are very useful back in the uh, days of um, Sun Yat-sen or Ed Lenin. Uh, parties were one of the most effective ways to organize people to overcome those, and they're very useful for, for democracy. But I also think that uh, nowadays, uh, parties are just one of the many uh, intermediaries, that is to say, people who organize people on behalf, speak on behalf of other people. But we now have the internet and you can see things like just this system where everybody can speak for yourselves without going through someone who speaks for you. And, and I think with this kind of new tools we can listen uh, to millions or thousands of millions of people simultaneously uh, without having to have a party to, to speak for anyone. So, so I'm independent, meaning that I won't ever belong to any parties. And uh, I think it is very rare that uh, our previous prime minister, uh, Simon Chang, and our current prime minister, um, Bin Chen, is, is both independent, right? They, they don't belong to any parties. And at this cabinet, we have more independent cabinet members than members of any party in the cabinet. So it is a very balanced cabinet. Although both parties don't really like this arrangement, uh, I think that means that we've got the balance just right. So, um, so I think this kind of uh, a balanced cabinet does make sure that we can talk about policy as policies and treat government employees as professionals who work with policy work. But one of the challenges is that the traditional political party system uh, 
traditionally sees themselves as closer to the people than the government employees is to the people. They sometimes see themselves, when they are legislators and other positions, as proxies who speak for a people in a, some region. And my work, um, uh, the open government work that I did with many people here, um, is just to make sure that the government employees can talk directly to the people, peacefully, calmly, designing the systems so that we can talk about one policy at a time. And I think the parties are also learning, the three parties, uh, <clears throat> the three major parties, and also well, the four or five parties, all have learned that they need to talk with people as if it's adults, it's peer-to-peer -peer talking. It's not treating uh, their constituents, their voters, as um, kids, as children. Because Taiwan is, after all, one of the most highly educated the most highly connected in order of network readiness uh, place on Earth. So it, it is unwise politically to treat the voters as children because everybody actually is very keen on getting knowledge on any policy issue. Of course, on the internet, we do have some issues with social media like Facebook or Messenger's uh, software like Line, which makes it easier to share something than to read something, right? If you click share, it's just one second, but if you have to read something, it's a minute or so. So, so we do get a lot of uh, rumors and a lot of uh, disinformation spreading around, but I think um, by far the, the Taiwan civil society is learning how to fact check, how to uh, check the rumors from the, the actual policy issues, and they do listen. Uh, when the government employees provide actual factual data uh, as evidenced by the recent uh, legislature uh, discussion of the special budget. I think they are also learning. <clears throat> they took a very long time not debating on anything. But <clears throat> for the past few days, they did uh, invite the government ministers and they did have a meaningful conversation uh, with the civil society on the specifics of the special budget. And I think everyone uh, watching the dialogue has seen the government employees, be they appointed ministers or the professional career uh, public servants, as responsible and uh, very like matter of fact uh, when dealing with rumors and disinformation and just curiosity from the civil society. So my work uh, here is to make sure that people don't spend too much time when working in the civil service to answer to the same question over and again. Um, in, in Taiwan, there is this suo zi, suo zi liao, data inquiry process in which the legislators or council members repeatedly ask the government employees of the same information, but they sometimes monopolize the information and just release part of it that uh, fits their agenda to the voters who voted for them. Of course, there are also very responsible legislators and council members who work on transparency. There's a little bit of both. But um, the government employees do feel a lot of stress because we, we do have you know our daily work to do. But uh, at some time, it just gets interrupted by those random uh, data inquiries. So my work in the uh, administration is to make tools, uh, make rules, make playbooks uh, to make sure that everybody just has to answer the same question once and then it appears uh, automatically as a shared uh, Q&A system uh, such as the, the infra.pd.tw website uh, where you can see that this is a collaborative system that uh, people just see those data inquiries and get checked by the ministries and then got edited and proofread and once they are approved, it automatically appears uh, in this public, full-text, searchable, uh, frequently asked questions. And so um, they stop getting a lot of inquiries after this system uh, goes online. Because everyone can just um, type whatever that they, they care about and see the answers that the public servants has provided. And we do use this uh, to communicate with the general public. 
And so after we got this online, uh, the speak spokespersons uh, of the Democratic uh, Progressive Party, the DPP, visited my office as did um, previously the, the camp, he and the MPP people also visit my office. And I always give them the same information saying that feel free to make it use of whatever that you would like of this information, but please uh, treat the civil service with respect and don't uh, interfere our, our daily work with repeat uh, questions. And the DPP did take this advice and uh, turn this into printed materials and also on their online live stream whenever anyone asks question pertaining to the special budget, they just quote it from this uh, website instead of forwarding it to the civil service. So in this one regard, I'm not saying other regards, but on this one regard, uh, I think the Democratic Progressive Party uh, is making good use of the resources that was built to save the civil service uh, some time. Um, the next question is saying, uh, as for today's topic, VR for civic deliberation, specifically virtual reality, is there any project currently proposed by the government? Yes, yes, there is. Um, so at the moment, every uh, Friday, we meet to talk with one petition case uh, from the joint platform. It is kind of difficult to explain just with words. So we have some video. Um, so let's see if the sound works now. Uh, but if it doesn't, well, I can provide a voiceover. Right, so this is the, the Shawana uh, episode where we see this petitioner here, walking through a night market. Ah, here we go. This is our monthly So this is the actual meeting where we vote three petition cases every month.
假设日后真的有这种类似杀人马这种东西，稀有动物出现的话，可以再去法律到底是不是有足以足够去保护这种先进？今天的这个消费法议题是我们后面来举办。那么在各位各部分的协助之下，那么今天很高兴呢，就是我们的第二年的现在上班人都出席了。我们大家一起讨论，我们这些问题。那此外呢，经过大家的共识的沟通呢，我们也从整出这些解决的方法。我们今天所有的产出呢，都会上传到我们的数位发展上面，供今天所有的与会者能够在日后需要解决的时候。很好，谢谢。感谢大家在这个星期五花了三四个小时左右的时间，大家一起对焦一下彼此的理解。那今天呢，我们谈的主题就不会具体被协助的事项之外呢，我也看到说，哎，我们会需要发布一个新闻稿来澄清这个现实。所以说，呃，我在星期一的政务会议上，我跟院长以及他政务人员们讨论一下，是不是在新闻传播处可能用一个微电影的方式，大家一起来把商量这件事情跟大家谈清楚。谢谢大家。
when the, the EVA Airways upgraded their local uh, flight, uh, the wing spot become too large, so that when one of the two uh, propellers uh, gets broken, it will crash straight to the third nuclear plant. And so this is not like secure at all. So they stopped the flight, and they've stopped it for a couple of years now. So the airport is now a Mosquito Airport. Now, um, the petitioners would like to revive the airport by deploying, uh, asking the Ministry of Interior to deploy the Black Hawk helicopters there. But why do they want Black Hawk helicopters? Certainly they cannot take it for tourism uh, on top of the Kenting National Park. That's not what Black Hawk is designed for. Um, and by the way, the National Park doesn't allow helicopters to fly in their zones anyway. So uh, it's not about tourism, it's about medical use because uh, their local hospitals, their three local hospitals, they don't have um, the, the necessary surgeons to provide, for example, if someone got a stroke, uh, then it's about brain surgery, right? They, they don't really have the equipment nor the um, doctors there. So at the moment, they have to drive by ambulance car about 70 uh, minutes to reach the closest uh, medical center, the anti-medical um, center. And if they want to go all the way here to Kaohsiung, uh, to Chang'an or some other hospital, then it's about um, 100 minutes or, or, or something like that. So it is, it is um, actually a very long trip <coughs> for, for a lot of people, and many people uh, died on the way uh, to, to the hospital. So they would like Black Hawk to be deployed and serve as their ambulance car. Uh, so when, whenever someone needs urgent medical attention, they can get onto a helicopter and then fly straight uh, to Rongzong or somewhere in Kaohsiung uh, and uh, get the doctor treatment in about 50 to 70 uh, minutes. So it's, it's still quite a flight and for people with stroke, maybe not the best transportation uh, option, but they really want to highlight their uh, problem with the local medical um, deployment. And you can see 8,000 people uh, seconded. And so uh, we first need to, sure, to make sure that everybody is on the same page as of what really is the medical conditions like in Hanchun. So we prepared um, a lot of materials pertaining to this case, asking, as you saw in the uh, movie here, uh, all the related ministries, such as here we have the Ministry of Interior, the Ministries of uh, Healthcare and Welfare, um, the Ministry of Transport and Communications, um, the local or regional government, uh, and the Ministry of Defense, all preparing uh, the local materials related to the Hangzhou medical situation. And we flew, um, well, really took the THSR. We transported about 30 people or so uh, to Hongshan locally to give uh, their presentations, but most importantly, to listen to the local people's uh, feelings about what is it like to live in a, a kind of remote place, even though it is part of the Taiwan, uh, right? So um, I think this is important because um, it shows that we're willing to engage in a conversation and it is much easier to get 30 people from Taipei to Hongshun than 300 people uh, from Hongshun to Taipei who, who wanted to participate in the discussion. And in Hongshun, uh, we had two different uh, meeting rooms because in public hearing, one of the uh, recurring problems is some people would want to protest, some people would want to shout uh, about, for example, the Taroko National Park, which has nothing to do with Kanding, but they want to talk about it anyway. Um, or <coughs> there, there will be people protesting about the right of the Aborigines, which is very important, but really not related to this case, uh, and, and many other local issues as well. And especially when a government minister comes, uh, there is a lot of people who want to have a word with me about things totally unrelated to this situation. So we made an arrangement using um, what we call telepresence. 
<coughs> meaning that we have two rooms. <coughs> we have the smaller room of about 30 something people of the facilitator Fang Rui as the meeting room from discussing. And so we have a very high quality discussion on many of the issues here uh, pertaining to, to Hong Chun. And so um, the, the whiteboard, the, the real time whiteboard that we did for this case was then shared uh, with everybody um, in Taiwan, but also most specifically every Friday after this meeting. Uh, the next Monday I take the summary and talk with the Prime Minister, with the Secretary General, with other ministers about how it is like in Hanchun and about the medical situation, uh, about the arrangement of the Minister of Interior, about um, the discussion about the local medical resources and even some other topics like whether it's feasible to build a high-speed um, expressway or how to revitalize um, the, the airport. And so it is very useful for policy makers because we know that everybody is on the same page. There's no rumors and all the legislators and city councilors uh, all saw the same uh, map and talk on a policy-based basis. So I think this is uh, one of the most useful use of virtual reality, is making sure that the visual, the audio signal can pass through uh, in a translucent, like semi-transparent way. It is like a one-way mirror where one uh, signal can pass through, but this signal doesn't really pass through completely. It gets filtered. So everybody just can talk about the policy issues on a matter-of-fact basis. So that is our daily use of this work. And uh, in the future, we're now working with virtual reality developers. So you don't have to go really into one of those rooms. You can just uh, sit at your home and put in your VR headset and enter the meeting room uh, with anybody else. And we're also working with the uh, HoloLens. It's called Mixed Reality. It is a semi-transparent headset that when I put it on, I can still see you, but I also see those empty chairs are now sitting with people. Uh, so it allows the overlay of two different rooms into one room, which is very useful if we are uh, someday going to put the legislators in Kaohsiung asking the prime minister in Taipei, uh, and it will uh, connect the two legislative halls uh, together. Um, you can take a picture with you after the speech, of course, of course. You can also take a picture with me during the, the break. Uh, we're, we're probably going to have a break at, I don't know, one hour into the discussion. You're okay with that? Okay, cool. Right. So, uh, so just remind me when, when it's, it's about one hour in. Um, and also, I think it, it's, it's any time if you want to, to take a picture, either as a collective or just with me, it's all okay. So, how could VR to be used for public servants at work? Excellent question. Um, see if, if you are uh, someone who work in what we call the BIM, uh, the, the building information system modeling uh, part or road modeling. It's likely that you've already used some sort of uh, automated computer assisted design to design the buildings and to design the, I don't know, the roads or something of the city. And the problem always is that when, when you need to bring it to the public hearing, uh, people can't really just look at some PowerPoint and understand what is it like when the building is being built. So maybe they will boycott the, the, the construction and say you will look much better if you move this road just a little bit closer. Uh, but, but it's impossible to, to make a meaningful debate when the pictures all exist just in people's heads. But with virtual reality, uh, it is now possible um, to, to do so. Um, it, this is one of the um, use of what we call the um, room scale uh, VR. I hope this sound still works.
Right, so this, this is called Cityscope. It is Legos, and it it's just Lego, the toy, right? And the colors represent uh, the, the, the difficulty of accessing the necessary um, utility services. But it can also be taken to model um, epidemics, to model population, to model um, <coughs> walkability, and so on. And then, so when people place those would-be constructions, uh, a projector from above and a camera from above take a picture of the Legos and identify what they stand like. And so this is just plain Lego, but if you take it into the, the camera place on the table, it almost magically gets recognized and calculated in simulation and it projected back. So everybody can talk about, okay, so what if we move the building over there? What if we make the road wider? And then see a real-time um, projection of what it would be like. So it, it makes it very easy for people who don't have a training as architects to talk about urban planning, to talk about building cities, building airports or something. And uh, we're working with the, the teams developing this also to extend this so that it can work in virtual reality. So only one room need to have those physical Legos and every other satellite place can just put on projectors or put on those VR classes and participate uh, in this kind of uh, collaborative city planning. So this is one of the, I think, the most useful thing to talk about. Uh, for example, the, the railroad constructions uh, in the special budget. That, that used to be one of the hardest thing to talk about in the entire special budget, mostly because most people don't have a mental idea of what is it like for the high-speed rails, for the Taiwan uh, Railroad, uh, and for the local MRTs in Taiwan. But with technologies like this, it makes it very easy, even like a toy, to, to play with the constructions and the road systems so that people can see and talk about whether you know, light rails is a good solution to the, this local case and without you know, going into arbitrary name calling or other things uh, on the other. So this is a very technical introduction, but, but you can see the, the potentials of this kind of technology for the public service in order to communicate our visions uh, to people. And if people like other architects who don't agree with our planning, they can say, okay, if you do this, right, and then we can run a different simulation. And you can even put on a um, like VR headset and feel how is it like in a future city with this plan and then in another plan uh, in order to, to talk about it. So we're now working uh, closely with labs in Japan, in Madrid, uh, in other cities who are interested in this kind of technology and bringing it uh, to Taiwan. Um, I saw a film about Shawaima that's made by the office. Can I explain it further? For sure. Um, so the Shawaima case is actually a real case. Uh, someone did bring it to the petition. I would, it's not uh, fictional. Someone really did put it to petition. The only fictional part about it is that it's not really 5,000 people uh, because the National Development Council said, you know, it's a fiction, it's fictitious. So they rejected the petition um, without asking us. I think it is very, uh, it's not the best uh, decision because in the, in the United States petition system called We the People, there are a lot of joke or, or fictitious proposals there. There was one about uh, the NASA should build a Death Star uh, petition. So you can see the White House petition. Oh no, it's a different person in White House now. Um, let's see, um, maybe we still have, maybe it's still in NASA. Um, Ah, here we go. So a lot of a lot of people seconded the uh, the petition to build a Death Star, which is in Star Wars a, a star-shaped weapon 
system uh, that Luke Skywalker uh, destroyed by flying X-Wing into it. Um, and uh, so they really want the NASA to build the Death Star. And instead of rejecting the petition, um, the NASA wrote a very long response saying that while the petitioner want to focus on a big project done a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, the response has led to a lot of people um, referencing the, the NASA's uh, Mars space program and the introduction of the commercial crew and cargo program. And the NASA responded very, very uh, down to the earth, saying that it will cost this much uh, and, and so on. And then, but NASA is focused on some other missions. So it is a very good um, opportunity for NASA to build a relationship with the petitioners by sending to their own email uh, inbox a letter explaining what NASA is actually doing. So I think the petitions are really a good way to build relationships over time between public servants and petitioners, and they have to you know, learn to talk to each other directly without going through representatives. So I think uh, it is very good for controversial issues, but also for joke issues like this. So uh, we decided then to revive the Shawarma petition, and, um, and we did send the video to the original petitioner, saying this is our response to your petition, uh, and build a film that explains the participation officer, the PO network that was built, uh, where we meet every month to talk about open government and petition uh, issues. There's a friend, uh, Xuan Ming, uh, from the Pingdong County. Um, we just got a big fire a few days ago in a illegal factory. Can we use VR to plan a firefighting or check the factories? It is actually a very good use of VR. Um, many uh, drone, that is to say, um, um, autonomous flying vehicles, uh, it's like a helicopter but very small, is piloted remotely by pilots wearing VR goggles uh, and going into dangerous situations to assess uh, the equipment and so on. And um, yeah, I, I grew up uh, watching Japanese anime like the, the Eva Evangelion or some other robotic uh, mecha uh, avatars, the five star uh, solar system or something. There's a lot of fantasies about remotely controlling robots to do dangerous missions. But nowadays, it is not a fiction anymore. Uh, people do do it for agriculture and for other uh, like filming purposes uh, literally every day now. Um, and so whether the firefighters can incorporate this kind of remote controlled systems into firefighting, I think it depends on two things. First, uh, we need to get the buildings themselves have uh, what we call the internet of things, the IoT systems, the sensors uh, built up so that we can know when humidity or when temperature raised above a certain level, it will automatically trigger the deployment of both the firefighters and, and maybe hypothetically those auto systems, the robots will arrive before the firefighters did arrive. And it need to be coupled with the BIM, the business um, information modeling systems. And one of uh, our youth council members, uh, Xiaomei, is now working with the Ministry of the Interior uh, on, on, on this direction. So I think it is actually one possible future, uh, and I, I do really want to see it, it happen. Uh, and the other thing is this uh, overview of illegal factories, its relationship with farmland and so on. We need to make this picture uh, much more clearly and to convey this complex relationship between farmlands and uh, industrial complexes to everybody involved. So people don't rely on hearsay or rumors, but can actually talk about these things on a matter of fact fashion. So we need both rapid responses, but we also need a overview system. And VR, I think, can help uh, both on that. Is there another platform called VTaiwan? What is the difference between VTaiwan and JOIN? That's a great question. The VTaiwan platform uh, is older uh, than JOIN. 
uh, I built it uh, with minister, ex-minister uh, Jacqueline Tsai and a lot of uh, Gulf Zero um, uh, civil society people uh, back, uh, way back in 2015 or so. So, um, so this, this is all about the digital economy. V Taiwan talks about the challenges that is brought by digital technologies and how the society needs to respond to those digital technologies. So we talk about crowdfunding, which is not possible without internet. We talk about sharing economy, which is not possible with the internet. We talk about uh, drones. So because these, and we talk about revenge porn, which again is not possible without the internet. So, um, so because this is all about the digital economy and the internet affairs, we use a much more complex and much more dynamic process because we assume most of the stakeholders are online. So we can use a lot more polished tools, such as the revenge porn issue. On the revenge porn issue, in, in addition to a briefing, we use this system called POLIS, which is an automated system that asks you what do you feel about even without the lies, sharing other people's body pictures should be treated as criminal, whether you agree or not. If you disagree, for example, your position moves in the downward, and you see another question about whether it should be criminal in proportion of how the names and the livelihood of the person is being considered. So if I say yes, I move a little bit here. So what, what is this? This is not about voting. So the numbers here doesn't really mean anything. You can see 15 people here, but they have a wider area than the 30 people on the left. It measures the diversity of opinions. It's not about voting. So if you get 5,000 people into the system, all vote exactly the same as you. It's just one dot. Uh, on this surface, it doesn't really change the picture. What we want is get as most uh, people's perspective and feelings as possible. So if you answer a few questions but don't see your perspective written, then you can then write your perspective and then it gets voted by other people. Um, and so we can see three groups. We can see group A. They, okay, <laughs> right. So group A don't think that you know um, uh, whispering of, of soft words between couples as you know private images, but group C thinks it is actually. So they have a difference in view. Uh, and group C here says says it's criminal, and group A is kind of okay, it's criminal, but not, not quite, maybe not. Uh, and uh, Group B think that the current criminal code is sufficient. Uh, no, it doesn't think it's sufficient. While Group C think it's, um, it's a little bit ambivalent. But B and A both think it's insufficient. And so we can do a lot of very interesting analysis uh, on the opinions of the three groups. But I think the most important thing here is the majority opinion. Like, everybody can agree on some basic principles. So, um, in a normal forum, like Facebook or PPT, PTT or some other forum, where people get to reply to each other, people most quickly find the point that they disagree and spend a lot of time on why they disagree and then spend a lot of time on why they disagree on the reasons why they disagree. And so they sometimes forget that there are basic things that everybody agree on a certain policy issue. You don't see a lot of that on Facebook or on PDD. People won't spend time if they agree. At most they click like, and that's the, the time they wish to spend on saying I agree. So, but in polis, it's impossible for people to reply to each other. If you've got a new argument to make, you get to write it, but as a new argument, not as a reply to an existing argument. 
and people start to see that the positions can change, and their friends uh, are all over the place. And it is not something that's set in stone, but a consensus that we gradually uh, submerge. And this is run and powered by open source software uh, by the community. It's not run by the government. Even now, the VTL1 system, the weekly meeting and everything, takes place uh, outside of the administration. So I'm just someone who says, okay, if you want some ministry to join the discussion, I can help you to find the right ministry, in this case, the Ministry of Justice. But it's not about petitioning. It's about people slowly converging on some perspective, on some issue that the internet, the digital technology, has brought upon on the society. But we won't discuss here things that are unrelated to the digital world, to the digital economy because for things like Hung Chun or, or the, the you know, Black Hawk helicopter, it's not about people's perspectives, it's about facts, hard facts that really needs to be checked on the spot. So it's a, a really different system from the joint system, which takes pretty much everything. It doesn't have to be related to the digital economy anyway, right? So, so it's, it's different in two ways. First, v Taiwan is experimental. The community takes whatever it likes uh, and bring the technology to, to whatever experimental way. But JOIN is the shared system between um, all sorts of governments. The legislative is now adopting JOIN next uh, half year. The executive branch, the Taipei City, the Nanto County, uh, and I think the Judicial Reform National Forum also say the Judicial Yuan wants to join as well. So, so maybe you will really join the five Yuans together uh, on the same platform, but it is entirely governmental. Uh, it is not community built. But we do take the good ideas from e Taiwan, uh, like the no replies, pro and cons discussion. We think it's a really good idea. So we, we did bring it uh, into the, the petition system here, where you can now propose uh, the pro and con uh, ideas and so on. And so it's not about just discussion. The joint system, the second thing, is that it's also about tracking what is going on after a policy is made. So all the administrative reviewed things, such as the Shalun uh, city construction, such as the you know, all sorts of disaster recovery and planning and everything here is being tracked in all the ministries. And we get some discussions here also. So for, for example, uh, the Kingman Bridge construction plan. Uh, we see what kind of bits that they have outsourced. And we see the um, budget and how it's being used. But this is very not typical. Normally, the budget use is, is like this. You, you don't see this kind of budget use because it means that you actually gave some budgets back. It's, it's very unusual, right? So for the Kingman Bridge issue, somebody said, is the picture wrong or not? <laughs> it's not very typical Chinese, but anyway, uh, everybody knows what this is asking. And so, um, so the, the person uh, in charge of this said, thanks for your attention. This is about uh, our uh, vendor actually not completing the work. And so we did give a notice, and we canceled the contract, and we took the money back. And then, uh, and then we chose another vendor, so, so you see things like this. But the good thing about this is that the next time a legislator, a local person, anyone who wants to uh, see what how Kingman Bridge is doing, they just type it to a search engine and find this page. You don't have to ask the public servant anymore. And if the public servant gets asked, they can just copy this website and then paste it uh, to anyone who asks, saying, okay, we will update you uh, every three months or every month just right here. So it is a continuation between petition, discussion, and then follow up uh, of the carrying so JOIN is part of the government system. It's got a regulation, a Yao Dian, uh, supervising it. Uh, but V Taiwan is experimental and it's mostly about the digital economy. Um, 
um, would this be to be recorded so we can revisit later? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, and then we'll also publish it on YouTube. It seems you got a British accent. How did you learn the cute accent? Um, <laughs> I don't actually have an accent. I learned English as my fourth language or something. Uh, I, I, my, my grandma, my father's mother, is from, from Lukang, and, and she raised me up uh, you know, speaking Taiwanese for long. Uh, and, but when I was seven years old and entered the, the primary school, we don't have the new K-12 curriculum at, at that time. So nobody really taught me how to read those books in Holoc. So, and so I know just very basic, primitive, like, you know, six-year-old Holoc vocabulary. Uh, and then everything that's more sophisticated, mathematics and, and literature, I learned it in Mandarin. It is just our generation, right? But, but the, the new generation is now much better. We did fix the curriculum. So, so they can learn about Hakka, learn about you know, all the Aboriginal languages, even if they, they want, and also the new migrant languages. So be it as, as a thing. Uh, I, I then moved uh, for a year to Germany and learned Deutsch uh, there. And then it's not until I go back to Taiwan, when I was uh, 13 or so, I started learning English. And I learned it exactly as you said, as you see here, just by typing. Uh, I don't have anyone to talk English with. I just hang out on a chat room and type uh, with people all over the world. So all the vocabulary I have is just to to make quick friends with people, uh, like like uh, just to 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 just talk with anything. Uh, so so we get a lot of uh, vernacular uh, English by typing. But I haven't really spoken to anyone. So when I was 20 or so, I started going around international conferences, presenting papers and talks, and um, and they noticed it's very weird because in Australia, when I give a talk, I will pick up a Australian accent because the speaker before me speaking in that accent, and I'll just pick it up. And but in US, I'll pick up a, a US accent, and in UK, I'll pick up a UK accent. Um, but, but it's because I learned English really late, and when I was 20, speaking English really late, uh, and so I don't really have a accent. So this accent is mostly, I think, because I probably watched some um, BBC episode or something uh, a day ago or so, and that was the, the last English um, acoustic model uh, in my brain, and I just modeled that accent. So if somebody starts talking with, to me like in a New Zealand accent or something, I'll just pick it up. Um, so I don't really have an English accent. Um, so uh, this way is cool yet hard for many groups, such as senior citizens, people who are low tech equipped. Is there any remedy for the situation? For the Hengchun case, we brought the computer to Hengchun. The room is the computer. People don't need to learn anything, right? The, the whole point is about assistive technology, is that it helps people to technology. It's not about we set a website and ask people in Hengchun to, to you know, express their, their thoughts, their feelings just by watching the live stream and typing it on the live stream chat room. That would be unfair. What we are doing is basically saying, here is a room, Anything you said in this room, anything, your hand motion, everything is recorded. And we promise to turn everything you said into transcripts. We promise to turn every sentiment, every feeling you expressed into online live stream so everybody can see it. But you don't have to learn anything. And we go to your place. Right, so, so this is the whole promise of assistive technology. It is just by making people learn uh, virtually with what they already know. My grandma now, 85, uh, she's the, the youngest of my four grandparents. My maternal grandpa is 98 now. Uh, my, my grandma, now 85, uh, loves to travel, but can't really travel much anymore. Uh, so when I visited, say, France or, or Germany, uh, before I go into the cabinet, 
I, I bring with me a, a 360 recording device, and when I visit my grandma, I visit her every month uh, in Danshui, uh, I just brought this VR headset to her and put her into the VR headset and say, Grandma, this is the, the castle of that. <laughs> and, and this is uh, one of the places in Hamburg that I just passed through, and then so on. And she can navigate very easily, just like walking and riding a car or something in the virtual reality, sharing the traveling experience. I think technology really should be like that. I'm not saying, you know, where am I? You should. Uh, VR basically means that you, you don't see anything else. It is immersive, meaning that you can't uh, really take your phone call during a VR meeting because your phone is now in front of your eyes, right? Uh, so, so VR makes sure that the person in the VR is immersed in a virtual reality and they can't get easily interrupted by something in their original reality. That's the definition of VR. But the same VR techniques can be used uh, in many different ways. If you have watched a IMAX movie, it is some kind of virtual reality as well, because everything is black and dark. You can't really see anything else. And if your phone rings, everybody gets mad at you. So it's basically a, a room scale uh, experience that also loosely fits the VR definition, because you, you feel you are somewhere else when you're in an IMAX movie. But, um, so, but in a video meeting, if you're just using your phone to, to have a video call, uh, you get distracted very easily. Like people may just talk to you nearby, maybe you get a phone call, maybe you get a notification. And uh, we found that in a normal video meeting, you can't really sustain people's attention more than maybe 15 minutes or, or 20 minutes. They get distracted very quickly. And so VR is also about making the experience distraction-free so that people can pay attention to what is going on around them. How do you think about the forward-looking infrastructure plan? It is really solid or not so accountable? That's a great question. Um, I, I only looked at some individual projects at the digital arm of the uh, forward-looking infrastructure plan. And many of those projects, I think, are really necessary about, for example, connecting uh, the remote areas, clinics, uh, so that they can do telemedicine. At the moment, it's really slow network connection, so they can't really transmit high-resolution x-rays or CT scans or something to a larger clinical center to read and then to get back. The transmission may take a couple of hours. If that, you just you know, send a car or something uh, to, to, to the medical center instead. So, but, but this is critical because in places like uh, Hengchun, um, sometimes you don't really need a doctor there. What you need is a high quality scan and send uh, the, the results over, over the internet and for someone at maybe Yangin or somewhere to, to help you to diagnose uh, the problem. So, so I think the internet infrastructure for this kind of medical use, I think it is really infrastructure and it is really critical. So we don't have any problem of approving this kind of uh, special budget. We also have uh, the uh, renovation project for the classrooms because in the new K-12 uh, basic education, we are now saying information systems and media literacy is part of the education now. It is not just one computer class that people in junior high school takes. Rather, from the primary school onward, the teachers need to use IT systems in, as part of education and also teach people uh, critical thinking, uh, to think for themselves. So this kind of setup, a projector, a screen, uh, a, a high-speed bandwidth system that connects to the student's cell phone, that, that is actually necessary for this kind of uh, education. And so we also approve a, a very large, uh, quite large budget for just making sure that every um, every two classroom that needs it, at least one of the uh, classrooms starting with the most remote areas has the necessary projectors and other internet bandwidth. And so without this kind of infrastructure, I don't think the new K-12 plan can succeed because we designed the K-12 plan with the assumption 
that the, uh, the students can access to the public internet for, for a lot of their uh, basic education. And also we think to by just using their cell phone to ask questions, uh, it means that they remain engaged with the lecturer. They won't just start playing video games on their uh, cell phones and so on. So, so I think it is a, a good use of taxpayer money uh, for this kind of basic infrastructure. Uh, the other digital infrastructures are about a common system that links the disaster recovery system and the earthquake prediction system and um, the, the what, what else? Uh, the water quality system and all the uh, measurement systems. They were uh, maintained by different ministries and now we're linking it together so that uh, we can make sure that when disaster comes, um, we present a, a unified interface so people can look at just one single map and see where the road is broken, where the electricity is out, where the water is um, not available, and, and so on. And so we, we got uh, a lot of system integration tasks to do. And, uh, and, and although we can do it on normal, uh, regular budget, the extra system that's needed to link the different ministry systems together, that costs uh, extra money. So we also uh, took some plans uh, to build this kind of uh, information system that reduce the maintenance uh, overhead going forward. So although it looks like we're, we're spending some money, uh, it's actually saving money uh, on the long run because the uh, same data doesn't need to be maintained by two ministries anymore. And we think that it's okay to, to use taxpayer money this way. So we have a few criteria. It has to be one shot. It's not about recurring uh, reimbursement. And the one shot, whether it's on software or hardware, need to benefit everybody on Taiwan equally. And that's our, our basic idea. Um, and I think, I think the, the digital plans are, are pretty solid, the ones that I did look at. Uh, while there's, of course, room for improvement, and that's for the stakeholders to, to discuss. I, I can't really speak for the other, uh, well, it used to be four, but now seven, parts of the uh, basic um, the forward-looking infrastructure plan. But from what I've learned uh, during preparation of the QA uh, system, of the infra QA, I think the, the most uh, difficult part for people is that people would really, really like uh, to have some kind of consultation when we are setting up this kind of criteria, like one shot, like no reimbursement, like it has to benefit everyone equally, it has to be the common good, what's the definition of common good? Although the Prime Minister did have this kind of criteria, we, we didn't really communicate it with the public. Instead, we communicate the result of applying this criteria to all the proposals prepared by the ministries and local governments. And although we tried to talk about sustainability and those criteria in our initial press conferences, the media just wasn't very interested in that. Uh, they were interested in other things, right? So, um, so it, it's a communication problem, and it is true that the, the general public think, mostly, even at the, this moment, that the forward-looking infrastructure plan doesn't have a coherent principle behind it, even though the Prime Minister, in the initial press conference, talked about those principles. It didn't really go through to, to most of the people. It is a communication failure. It is entirely, um, I admit that. So when I prepared this q and I said that, you know, we, we should do it better, um, but we're not used to that. Um, and the people working in the ministries, while well, they're very uh, busy preparing those uh, reports, they're mostly on paper. We have a series of meetings where they print PowerPoints and write down those PowerPoints. Even if we want to make this public, it would not make sense because all the context is in the heads of people uh, in that meeting room uh, talking about this criteria. So I think this is about the bandwidth of the government. If, instead of just PowerPoints printed on paper, if the ministries can send us models, data, evidence, in addition to the PowerPoints uh, when we're talking about those projects, then we can much more easily share this with people when we're talking about the first principles. Um, and of course, we can also get professional help to, uh, to this kind of thing. 
But it's very easy for me to publish something if it's already digital when sent to me, like the autonomous car. There is actually autonomous car in the forward-looking infrastructure plan. It's just categorized under green energy, not transportation. So people don't know that it exists. That it exists. Uh, and the digital information that I got, the transcripts and everything, I did publish, and people make very good use of the transcript. But every handwritten notes and presentations I can't publish because it would you know, take too much time to digitize those handwritten notes and it wouldn't mean much anyway. So um, in the administration next year onward, we're now uh, embarking on a project called the Zheng Wu Da Shu Ju Policy Making Public Data, whatever system, to have a, a data store where the ministries can uh, deposit to when talking about uh, cross ministry uh, level projects. And when we have that system, when we get um, you know, iPads instead of handwritten notes uh, in our administration level decision making system, then we can make those public much earlier than we currently are. And I think there it will clear a lot of uh, misunderstanding and rumors. So what we did learn uh, from the infrastructure plan planning process, and I think um, it's all about the perception, and we we can do better uh, in the future to make the first principles. Uh, to make the focus on sustainability and regional balance uh, communicated much more clearly with the general public, not just with a few selected media, which got washed away uh, very quickly. Um, how can we use VR in agriculture? Well, there's a lot of uses. Um, you can use it for, for agricultural planning and zoning. You can use it to simulate uh, the different decisions, uh, the use of pest, pesticides versus not. Basically anything that's, that's dangerous, expensive, or unhealthy, you can simulate with VR and don't suffer the same consequences. You can break a lot of things in VR and nothing is really broken, right? So, so anything that requires simulation of any kind, training of any kind, uh, you can do it in VR. Actually, VR has been around for 30 years or 40 years or something, but almost exclusively in military training. So when, when a fighter pilot learns to fly a, a F-15 or something, or uh, a NASA uh, astronaut learns to fly a rocket or something, of course they do it in VR. Although VR is, was very expensive back then, it is far less expensive than an actual fighter jet or a rocket, right? So, so if you learn it this way, a space shuttle, uh, this way, then, then you avoid much costlier mistakes tomorrow. So what we are using now is actually a, a, a cheap version of the actual military grade VR and turned into consumer grade uh, thing. But with the rapid uh, process of uh, machine learning and, and of data processing, we, we are now entering a place where we can generate data very quickly. And so um, actually in the past two years, using just our smartphones, there's 90% of all data generated in humankind history was generated in the past two years because our cell phones are, and other devices are now living with us and gathers data as our eyes and ears do, right? So to process this kind of data in a natural way, to visualize it in a natural way, because it was captured in a real life uh, context, you really need something like VR in order to, to make it come live again. Because if you just put it as slideshows or as text or something, it, it loses the context in which it was captured. So this is why I prefer 360 recording to this kind of normal video recording. Because in, in video recording, the person holding the camera, I think, has too much power. Uh, they don't get recorded. And they decide who gets recorded. And it can make a very unbalanced uh, narrative. But with VR, with 360 recording, everybody gets taken in every angle, right? So everybody can just put on the headset and go back to that moment in time. And so this is not just for meeting, but for planning and things like that. If you just look at aerial photos of a farmland, it is impossible to zoom way in into it and feel how is it like. So VR helps us to zoom from the earth level to the islands, to the county, 
to the to the farmland level and without using different tools, different abstraction to to think between different levels as, as we do now, right? For the national land use planning, we use one set of tools, but for local zoning, we use another set of tools, and for a specific industry or farmland, you know, we use another set of tools, and the tools themselves doesn't really talk to each other um, in this way. So, I think a lot of planning work can use use VR. Um, excuse me, but could you please talk about your opinion of 12-year compulsory education? Um, first, it's uh, now that the Experimental Education Act has been around for a few years now. It's not compulsory to go to school anymore. It's just compulsory to get some education. So uh, if, if you your, or your child has a different plan to go about educating themselves, all they need to do is write a proposal and get the local city um, education council to approve it, and they don't need to go to school anymore. And it's applying all the way through the K-12, and they can use some school facilities, like two days a week or something, uh, and then all the way to the uh, first, um, from the first grade um, to, to the 12th. And so um, I think the new uh, curriculum uh, is, is really revolutionary. Uh, and I, I say so not because I worked on it before entering the cabinet. I really think it, it, it marks a rethink of education. Um, before, uh, in the current curriculum, in the 99 curriculum, we evaluate students based on not only capabilities or skills, uh, and we rank right, their performance on the basis of those capabilities. Of course, children compare each other uh, based on scores and whatever. right? Uh, but in the new curriculum, we're focusing instead on literacies, on suyang. And, and the, the three basic literacies are being autonomous, like um, you know, self-motivated, um, being interactive, like being able to communicate with people, and the common good, meaning that to think of things that benefits all, all the parties involved instead of being very selfish or self-sacrificial, right? So the, the whole thing is about literacies, and everybody grows to a different dimension according to the new curriculum. Uh, our goal with the new curriculum is by high school, every student has their own curriculum. Everybody picks their classes just like university students do nowadays, but do so in high school. And every high school also has their own um, specialty classes, like philosophy class or whatever, right? So, so I think uh, this is a rethink, because then we can't really compare children anymore. Uh, and when people don't get compared, their self-confidence becomes more stable. Uh, they become more self-assured, because they only measure themselves, their capabilities, with the, the post of what they want to do, instead of by people just, who just happen to be nearby them in the same class. And, and so um, to make sure that this education gets um, get through, I think it is most important for the people who are learning to be teachers, like you know people here, uh, to to also experience some of this this kind of self-directive learning by themselves, because otherwise they can't really learn with every child differently as they are. Uh, and the new evaluation criteria would not make sense to those teachers because they were not tested in that way. So so there is a generational gap, but I think. It is good that we delayed uh, the, the new curriculum by one year because now the teachers get much more time to replan their uh, local curriculum and courses, but also the history uh, curriculum gets to be on board on the same year, which is great because otherwise it would cause massive confusion. Um, so so I, I'm very positive on the outlook of the curriculum. And because the experimental education is legal, so we took a lot of this into the basic education, but anyone who isn't, you know, who isn't fit with basic education can always go to experimental education. So, so basically, it's it's now a collaborative culture because the same elements, the literacy-based uh, elements, are now common in both the experimental and soon to be the basic education system, and that's the main thing that we took from the experimental education system in the new curriculum. As a public servant for more than one year now, uh, what do you want to change and reform? Well, I joined last October, so it's not 
really one year, uh, right? It's, it's just a few months. <laughs> but but uh, I think um, I I'm, I call myself a a public servant of public servants, right? Gongpu the Gongpu when I when I first entered um, the the cabinet. So it means that I serve the public service, right? It is not my place to direct where the public service should go. Rather, uh, all the participation officers from all the ministries come to me and say, hey, minister, uh, the people using Macintosh and Linux cannot file their tax online, and they're blaming us for it. Uh, but we, we got 100% mark uh, on, on those RFPs, what's really going on? Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll just help them going through the RFPs and see that, you know, even though all the functionalities are there when you use a Mac to file your text, what the RFP doesn't show is that it takes half an hour between step one and step two, and 15 minutes between step two and step three. So it, it's actually a very long time to actually file the text. But if you just look at the RFP, it, it's all checked, it, it's all there, right? And, and it got through because the people working on it and the people approving, none of them use the Mac, all of them use the Windows. So, so it is uh, actually not really useful a way to plan something. And so as the uh, working someone who works on digital service, I think service design, the way to incorporate people who use the service as part of the design. If you design for Macintosh using people, you ask people who use Macintosh to join your design team. If you design for Linux, you ask Linux using people, right? Instead of saying the public service should know everything, which is impossible, what we should do is just simply include more stakeholders when we are planning our RFPs. But, but it is actually a very simple idea, but very hard to follow. Um, the accounting person, uh, or the you know Zheng Feng person, or whatever, right? The auditing people, they they are not used to this kind of working process. They always worry about uh, you know um, you know special treatment to Li or whatever, right? So, but but it is it is radically important that we do it in a transparent way, so people don't say it's to Li, but. It is also important to really include users, not just you know consult three professors and think it's it. It's not. You really need to get the early prototypes. And so I'm very happy to say that by next year, our text paying text filing system will be cross-platform and work on Linux and Mac because it's made a priority. But I do this not because I'm a Mac user, well I am, but uh, and it's it's not that I order the Ministry of Finance to do this is because they come to me saying, hey, there's people petitioning, saying that our tax planning system are crap, what should we do, right? And then I'm like, okay, so, so you should do this. So as a public servant to public servants, uh, I, I don't really give commands. Uh, I don't take commands either, right? So, so all I offer is suggestions, and all I take is suggestions, including from the Prime Minister, uh, and none of it is binding. But very fortunately, I think many public servants do see that this new process of working with stakeholders, of working it out in a calm way, uh, not in a shouting way, of communicating you know, with stakeholders instead of just seeing them as mobs or whatever, actually improves policy. So we do get a lot of useful, interesting cases going on. And I, so I won't change or reform anything, but if any of you want to change or reform and need some help, just come to me and <laughs> I'll introduce you to, to people. And I think that's, that's my basic attitude as a public servant of public servants. I think the rules of slide are based on attendance rationality. What about your opinion? Well, not, not really. In Slido, we also get people posting a lot of exclamation marks, shouting, or whatever, right? But but this this it doesn't really attract uh, people's sympathy unless people really feel the same way. So, in a large like thousand of people uh, place, we do get a lot of um, you know irrational posts, uh, but they almost never get voted to the top. So I almost never see it, uh, but. There's exceptions. When I uh, give a lecture at the Zhongshan University, uh, the first, the topmost thing 
is about this thing called Chu Ban Hui, where this motorcycle parking uh, at admission uh, just took away uh, the students' parking motorcycles or something. Uh, and it creates quite an outrage, so that uh, hundreds of students just voted to the top, even though I don't really know what Chu Ban Hui is about. Uh, but they know that their principal is you know, with me, and he of course knows what this is about. And so we talk about this right away and, and talk about it. So if the majority of audience feels strongly about something, Slido also surfaces up, you don't need rationality, but you do need resonance uh, with the whole uh, room, with, with the people, and I think that's uh, the point of the Slido system. Um, you're the pioneer, well, one is the pioneer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, Zhou so Junxun or Zhenyang Yi for sure is older than me, so I wouldn't call myself the pioneer. <laughs> so one of the, the earlier uh, self-educated people. Uh, since you're a successful example of self-learning, some parents want to copy your model onto their children, which is always a disaster. Um, so basically, I, I wouldn't command or, or even think uh, people copying anyone's model, especially not mine, uh, because it, it, it's, it doesn't work. It, it's not in the 80s. 90s anymore. Uh, in the current educational atmosphere, it is far easier to find a supporting group locally rather than like, like I did, which is almost entirely in one university and over the internet. It is, it is not normal now. Now it is almost e too easy to find a support group on Facebook, online, on some other social media, and then just join the interest group that already cares about the thing that you care about. Uh, so this is a, a different landscape now. And I think nowadays the children, they, they are more than capable of finding those interest groups. I think one of the things that parents can do is just you know, showing interest, showing curiosity, and asking their children to show them around in those new um, be there online games or Pokemon Go or whatever uh, new worlds that their children is immersing themselves into, um, because there are entire worlds now that's cyberspace uh, that's in exists uh, online mixed with offline. Whereas uh, when I was uh, you know self educating, the cyberspace was still being built, it was still being being constructed, and there's no existing cyberspaces. We were the first people to build websites, right? So, so it's, it's a different uh, era, and I wouldn't uh, encourage people in this generation to copy uh, my parents' model, which only worked because it was uh, the, the 80s and 90s. But, but now I think uh, self-educational self-learning is not being a buzzword, it's stopped being a hot topic now. It is just something that some people do, and for a few years, they may be back to the school, but maybe again for a few years, and I don't think it's something that's special nowadays. And so people who talk about self-education, like give a lecture, I find are mostly parents. Uh, when I actually go to a high school or go to a university, they, they don't ask me anything about self-education. For, for them, it's just you know, part of life, right? So, so there is also a, a generational conversation that could happen around this issue. How do you think? And if both the father and mother have to work, do you think it's possible for them to accompany with their children in their self-education? For sure. Um, and this is what's different between the 80s and 90s and now. Uh, now, uh, in many cities, and I don't pretend to say it's all the cities, but in many cities, it is possible to find health circles of people who self-educate their children. And many of those parents are also professionals in some way, and they also open up classes and to, to just swap their children around and teach their children what they know. And there's also organization-based uh, self-education and that allows the, the children to determine their own course of work and so on. So even if both parents are working, it is almost always possible to find somewhere nearby that has a, a study group or a, a uh, experimental school going. And uh, it's mostly not about um, the time that you will need to spend with your children, which I'm sure that the parents always do find some time, but, um, but the management of expectation of the grandparents, of the uncles, of the aunts, right? That, that's the hard part, because people, when, when the children go on experimental education, they start having all sorts of fantasies about what they can do. But really, it's just another model of education. It's not that different, but people start 
asking all sorts of questions and having a lot of uh, wild um, fantasies and whatever. And and as parents, that's the social pressure that, that the parents need to deal with. And it's not about going to work or something. It's about talking with the children and saying that no matter what you do, um, that one of the parents or both parents support them in, in their decisions and talk it through. And after talking it through, do the convincing of the extended family and friends and whatever for the children so the children doesn't feel alone and for defending themselves. And I think that's the one thing uh, a parents or parents can do for their children in on self education because while the children know how to talk to children at their age about why they go to self education, they don't have the vocabulary to talk to grown ups about the same decision that they did. And the parent named person I'm sitting, right? I'm standing person I've ever seen. I just wonder that about you. What is the most important thing of the whole life? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you see, um, I, I see my, my life as somewhat of a, a accident or a, as a miracle. Because for most of my early childhood, I was told that because of my heart, congenial heart disease, uh, there's just 50% chance I will live to do 12 or something. So I get told about this, about my doctors all the time. And so because of this, um, every time I, I go to sleep, even now, uh, every night I go to sleep thinking, have I really done all my deals? Is this okay if I don't wake up, wake up? And I'm like, okay, it's fine. And then I wake up feeling refreshed, being new, being, okay, I can do something new. Right, so, so uh, and, and this is a habit that goes I think way back before I have memories. It must have formed when I was two or three or something. So so because of this, every day I see my life as something that's a miracle, that, that's just accidentally given to me. So so every day I get to choose a different meaning of life for that day. Uh, and then and then live a very short life that is just one day. And then and then feel that I have no regrets for the day and I get to sleep and waking up have a new meaning. Life. So, so that's my trick. But, uh, but it's not something that I learned. It's just something that's part of my my psychology when when I was very uh, very young before I even had memory. So I have a very different outlook on life with most people. Uh, I, I don't see you know fame or fortune or money or whatever as as important because it's just it doesn't last over a day. And uh, I always want to plan for you know a few generations in the future because. That that's what what counts. Um, uh, it looks like you know so many things. What is your most in interested area, and what's your motivation of involving in it? At the moment, I'm most interested in those twenty questions that I need to answer uh, for the next forty or so minutes. Um, and um, and it, it, it's it's true. I mean, my my motivation is always crowdsourced, meaning that it's determined collectively by you. Uh, if you don't ask me anything, I'll just sit here and say nothing. Um, I've done this before, <laughs> and people are starting asking me really interesting questions. So, so, um, and and I think this is mostly about curiosity because I'm really interested in the question that you will ask, and and vice versa is reciprocal, right? So that's that's why. Most of you are not falling asleep right now, so so I think it is mutual, and and I, I do this um, practically every day, and so I'm most interested in just listening and, and get us into a, a habit, a space of listening to each other. Uh, what do you think about the aging population, about the decimating population of Taiwan? Is it really a problem? We can solve it by allowing migrations. At least the progress of technology can also overcome the lacks of human power. Well, you said it all. It's not really a question, is it? Uh, I agree, <laughs> right? So um, I, I think the the aging population, of course, creates its issues. But as my experience with my grandparents told me, if you arrange the the long long time care, the the technologies just right, as long as their minds are still active. Their aging bodies are less and less of a problem nowadays, uh, and we're trying to solve it even more quickly with the help of technology, of robotic assistance, of exoskeletons, of virtual reality, of personal assistance, um, automated assistance, remote control assistance, 
and, and things like that of, of the you know the room itself being aware of the needs of the aging body and taking care of it and so that part I'm less worried because Taiwan has one of the best if not the best uh, medicine uh, research community to address this kind of issues it is one of our main you know exports of ideas and technology and I think it's it's, it's really fortunate that all my grandparents have to live in Taiwan. So, and, so that's, that's one thing. Um, and it's, it's about health care. And as of, about the, the reduction of population, um, as I explained, I, I think us is not a monopoly of, of human beings, right? It was dinosaurs, now it's human beings. Maybe it would be other sentient species of human yes, uh, down the road. And I think Taiwan, existed four million years before, before human beings. And it will continue to exist as an island four million years afterward, when there's no human beings anymore, when we move on to Mars or to some other planets. So, so, so Taiwan uh, is a stage on which sentient beings live. Uh, and humans, I think, don't have a monopoly. So if we pollute the ecosystem too much so that new sentient beings cannot evolve or arrive in Taiwan for millennials. Down the road, I think that's a, that's a crime uh, against new sentient beings. Um, and and it's, a, it's a geographic based view in Taiwan that I, I always had, but very few politicians share, so I don't talk about it that much. <laughs> but, but, but I think it's, it's one of the ways that we see ourselves as just caretakers uh, of the island. And if we reduce the number of caretakers, but we can still do an equally or even better job at caretaking. I think that's, that's good. Uh, we don't need that many people in Taiwan. We need more marine species. We have 10% of the whole world's marine species in Taiwan. And then we, and we should just keep this diversity, this sustainability. And if more human beings help out, well, more human beings. If less human beings help out, well, less human beings. And it's a very radical and ecological view, but that's my view. Uh, actually, I look forward to meeting you. I'd be excited to meet you too. Uh, um, yeah, um, hello. There's a lot of hellos. Um, there's a lot of hellos. That's an exclamation mark. Uh, okay. We know that you have doing this self learning from junior high school. Can you give us some suggestions about self learning and what can our future teachers do? That's a great question. Um, I think it's not about teaching anymore, um, it's about learning together. Uh, when we're designing the new curriculum, why we put the autonomous as the topmost value is because when people enter the primary school and 12 years pass and they exist the senior high school, uh, the world has already changed. The, the many fields that existed back then doesn't, wouldn't exist. To, uh, yes, in the future, many fields will be combined, new fields will arise, and uh, students need to learn to learn, and then that's, that's the only thing they need to do, because they're going to, to be doing that throughout their life. That is just what technology has prompted us. It's impossible now to say that I'm good at one thing, I'm doing it very well, and I'm doing it for life. Um, at some point, machines is going to come and say, you know, it's 80% of it is automated. And then you have to focus on the other 20%. But the other 20% is disintermediated, meaning that you don't have to go through a manager, a dispatching taxi company or whatever anymore. You can always talk directly to the people needing the service. So there's another class gone, right? So with this structural adjustment of fields of the digital transformation, what we need to do is to uh, define ourselves as the work that we do. Like I said, you know, my work is to, to listen, to open up the government, and so on. But this is not my day-to-day my -day job. It's not the task that I do. My job, you know, is setting up some systems, typing in some things, looking at some paperwork. But, but if those things are automated, I lose my job. But I still keep my work, because my work is furthering listening, furthering communication, furthering transparency. All the machines can do is help me on my work while they take my job away. I, I would do some other job, right? But if students grow up confusing the idea of a life's work and a moment's job and define them themselves in terms of their job, then when the machines come and take the job away, they also took their pride away. They also took their self-esteem away. And that's very 
dangerous. Um, so, so we really need to grow up with the students by being collaborative learners, by letting them know that it's always okay to learn new things and that they define their own life's work, but the jobs that need to be uh, learned to further this work will keep changing. And that's, I think, one of the most important that teachers can uh, show the students by being a lifelong learner also. What is the most important value and the most important thing parents should make your kids know? Well, I don't know. I don't know your kid. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the kid. <laughs> It depends. It depends on your parental relationship, right? I'm not a crystal ball. <laughs> I can't really answer questions like this. Is that, yeah. um, if you introduce me to, to you, your home, and your children, we spend maybe 40 hours or 100 hours together activities. Maybe I can make some educated, informed guesses. But with just this words, it's impossible. I'm very sorry. Um, Pinch of disappearing due to technological advances by American survey. What suggestions for the next generation? Well, don't focus on jobs. See some see jobs as something that you just have to go through and to further some work. Define a life's work by each individual life. That's just what everybody's doing nowadays in, in technologically advanced countries in their education system. It's why we need a education reform for digital transformation because otherwise when people compare themselves on some you know speed of running or typing speed or things like that um, it's doomed because automation is just going to come and automate everything right so things that cannot be automated because machines don't have a human life they don't have a human's body it's not possible for machines to have real sympathies as one human being to one another, or as a, a animal to one another, right? So spending more time with people uh, is going to be one of the most important things in the future in all disciplines, because things that doesn't need to spend time with people to accomplish, to have a person's body to accomplish abstract things, that's going to be automated away. So if we train our children to be machines, to doing machine work, machine labor, they, they will feel utterly lost when machines actually do their job better. But if we, we bring them up as human beings and respecting each other as human beings, but machines are just here to help. Um, I would like to know what that your life changing when you enter the government. Surprisingly, very little changed. Um, I, I, I slept earlier and woke up earlier. That's about the only change. Um, I used to give classes in um, many different places in the world, and now my travel is restricted. Um, that I'm not used to that. But uh, I found ways around. Um, I use robots, use VR. I still give classes in Hangzhou, in Madrid, just by them watching a VR avatar of me or a robot of me. And there is nothing in the United Nations ruling that says a foreign minister cannot look at a recording or a robot of Taiwanese minister. So, so we do a lot of diplomacy using virtual reality this way because well, there's nothing the rules against that. For all they know, they're just watching a movie. Uh, and so, so this kind of um, adjustment I really have to make because I don't have that much time spending um, my time abroad, but I substitute it with uh, telepresence, with robot, with virtual reality. And so far, it's been working really well. But otherwise, I'm just doing exactly the same, same thing as I did uh, before joining the cabinet. I'm still public servant of public servants. It's just the taxpayers are now paying me to dedicate my, my work on this and not just as one of my projects among, you know, working with Apple, with University, Oxford University Press and other Silicon Valley companies. I don't have to spend time on those things now. I get to focus on public service, but otherwise I'm doing exactly the same thing. Uh, would you introduce some websites that introduce useful or cool stuff, like Slido? Uh, of course, why not? Uh, so this is our website, PDIS, PDIS.tw, which is just a shorthand for PDIS.national.government.tw. So in, in this website, you get to see some cool movies that you've probably already seen. There's a play for you, uh, and there is the track of all the meetings that I hold, and there is this tools part. 
to introduce some cool tools that we use every time um, for, for luck. So for, um, feel free to reference. You also see our team here. Like the, the first three people look kind of normal. But it gets weird um, progressively downward. And until the last person who, who is sitting right here, <laughs> which is laughing exactly like this. Um, right, this is our team, the, the public digital innovation space team. Uh, and if you're interested in, in any of us, you just you know mouse over this and see the name and you know someone who proclaimed that he is not a giraffe for some weird reason. I don't really know. Uh, someone says that they are from the triple I, uh, and um, and so on. So you get to learn something about our team, and then if you have anything to ask, just click on any of our heads and you get into this public Q&A place where you can ask anyone in our team and we try to answer you uh, as quick as we can publicly. And so we don't give exclusive uh, interviews, everything needs to be recorded and so on, but people find this to be very useful, so most of them just come here and type me some questions. So feel free to, to ask any of us questions. and. We can bring this conversation uh, forward on. And just new a public platform called Join. It seemed to work pretty good. Thank you. How do you expect to this website? Well, Join is, is really nice because um, it's now part of the administrative work. It's not something that's special. It's just everyday work now. All the legislations uh, and regulations that the uh, administration proposes now regularly need to be reviewed for 60 days publicly, or shorter than 60 days, but whatever many days they need to be uh, talked online. And so we can see a lot of people's feedback on the regulations that were about to pass, such as, wow, this thing about firefighting really has a lot of responses. Um, and you can see the civil society, the stakeholders uh, asking uh, substantial questions and have the, the NFA uh, answering to them uh, in real time. And I think this is a really good dialogue that's been going on between firefighters and uh, the stakeholders and people who care about them. So before, we, we had this announcement, but it's just um, you know for 14 days or before for 7 days. But the effect of 60 days is that people can actually take notice of this and organize and ask meaningful questions, get meaningful answers for a few rounds before the regulation actually got passed. Now this is, I'm not taking the credit because this changed to 60 days before I joined the cabinet. But after I joined the cabinet, I made sure that the 60 days are not just spent on calling this person or writing to this email, which would overwhelm this person with you know, a lot of duplicate questions. But rather, uh, I use the joint platform to make sure that all the Q&As can be made public so that they, and they have to answer one thing once, and then the discussion can progress into much deeper reflections like this. So, uh, so I don't have much other expectations beyond what's already there in the tracking of the budgets, uh, in the proposals. Now maybe, of course, there's still the fourth part, which is writing a minister. Uh, and well, I, I do think we can improve here, because many of those minister mailboxes are just, again, answered by one single person over email at the same way over and again. I think we can deploy the wise like like system of public Q&A also in this section. So maybe we'll improve this section. But as a pu public servant and public servants, I'll only do so if the ministers ask me to. I will not force it uh, to my colleagues. Uh, do you think it is necessary for school children to learn programming, how to cultivate this ability? I, I think programming or coding uh, is a lot like law. It is like law in the digital space. Um, but the difference is that it's like physical law. The law enforces itself. You don't need a lawyer to interpret this kind of law. But just like legal education, we don't train our children to become lawyers, right? But we say every child needs legal literacy. Because if you don't understand the importance of the law, 
well, you do illegal things and suffer the consequences. So it's vital and important to know what law is, the basic principles, some basic ability to read and understand law and regulations. And when you encounter a legal, you know, uh, a police or something, know your rights uh, to, to those laws and so on. And so we say all the children need to know these things. I think it's very reasonable. But if we say all children need to become legislators, they need to be writing new laws from scratch, I think it's, it's impossible, and because some people are just not interested in writing laws, right? So I think it's the same with programming. It's very useful for everybody to know how a computer thinks, what algorithm or data is, and when encountering things on the internet, know your human rights on the internet. This is very important, know the cybersecurity issues. But not all children need to become lawyers, and not all children need to become programmers. It's useful for they be able to understand what a program is, to look at a program and not to be confused or terrified by it. But whether they need to write new programs from scratch, I don't think so. Um, I think they just need to learn the basic idea, the design thinking, the computational thinking that goes on when designing programs. I think that's useful, but not writing whole system level programs from scratch. As of how to cultivate this ability, it always helps to find something that the children care about or the parent care about. Uh, one of my friends, um, Linda Lucas, who, who wrote a, a book about Ruby, called Hello Ruby, it's a programming book. She told the story of uh, she's teaching Arduino, which is a kind of uh, small hardware uh, programming to, uh, to women. Uh, she runs a lab. Uh, and one of the, the younger mother uh, learned Arduino because she wanted to make a uh, counter with LED, a digital clock. But instead of displaying the time, it's connected to her phone or her, her uh, uh, arm wrist. That counts for her child how many steps away mom is from home. So when, when she walks slowly to the home, her child sees the numbers uh, from 100 to 90 something to 80 something and expects uh, mom, the mommy to, to be home when the, the number drops down to zero. And it's a very useful thing for the child because the child wouldn't cry, right? The child would know expecting the mom to be at home at some day. And the mom would walk you know, in a very steady uh, pace knowing that uh, her child is expecting her. Uh, and I think it's, it gives both sides uh, some comfort of mind. But this is a real use case that the mom herself thought up. It is some, not some homework, not some textbook uh, exercise. It's solving a real life issue, a problem, right? Uh, so this is what we in the programming world know, called uh, scratching what's an itch. It's something that you feel uncomfortable. And then programming helps you to automate this by the way so that you feel comfortable. And everybody has one different niche. So it's impossible to cultivate without knowing what your children care about. But if they care about something, there is some way for programming to make it better, whether they learn programming or not. So this is a uh, message just to find what your child cares about. Have you thought about retirement? Oh yeah, I was retired before I joined the cabinet. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, um, but yeah, I retired just for a couple of years uh, before getting into public service. But in, in some sense, I'm still retired now because, because I, I don't really have something that I feel I must accomplish in life. I think I've gone through plenty of, of lifetimes. Uh, and so whatever I do now, I do now for fun, for curiosity or for crowdsourcing, meaning that people I care about, like you, ask me questions that I care about, so I answer them. But I don't have anything that I think that must be done in my lifetime. Uh, and so whenever someone reaches the state of mind, I think it's a good time to retire uh, and to, to leave the, the work, uh, most of the work, to, to young people who still feel very strongly about their ideals and about things that they want to accomplish in life. Uh, for us, other people, it's all okay. We're, we're just here to, to you know, tag along with the kids and see the, the young people uh, thrive. 
Um, so to, yeah, I, I really talk like a, a old person, but this is really what I feel. Um, most of my work nowadays is to, to prepare the stage so people who are educated in a new curriculum can, can enjoy the world in which that they are allowed to be the most creative and explain their concerns to the people of the upper generation uh, and explain in their own terms. This is why I explain the concern of the eSport uh, athletes, the, the Tianjin uh, players, in terms of Wei Qi, uh, of Go, uh, to the Ministry of Culture people. Because Go is the, the Wei Qi game, is something that they know, and they, they have maybe played in their teenage. So just by explaining eSport in terms of Wei Qi, it brings uh, the young part of the ministry's public servants back to the discussion and the young people talks with the young people in a much more direct way. But if we keep talking about you know things that they don't understand or have first-hand experience, it doesn't work. Uh, and so I think one of my, my uh, joy is in helping the different generations to understand that their life experience isn't actually that different, it's just different names. Any ideas to use VR in crime prevention? I don't have any ideas. I'm sure you have some. Uh, there, there's, there's surely some, some useful thing. Uh, remote control drones being one, but there's a lot of uh, simulations that could be done in VR also. But I'm not an expert in crime prevention, so I'll leave it to experts. You're a very great autonomous learner. Could you talk about autonomic learning? Um, well, the thing about self-directed learning or autonomous learning, I think that's what children do, naturally. Children learn because it's fun, because they're curious about the environment, because they trust uh, that they will get answers from the environment. If the environment stops giving the children that, the children will start to suffer. And uh, the discipline that the previous century was giving the children was to make them like machines so that they are only curious about certain things and get good about their skills. But as I just explained, machines are better than children at being machines. So, so we're now going to have machines who, who take over this kind of thing anyway. So, so I think nowadays, being autonomous and get back to the childhood kind of curiosity, I think that's the most important. And the cultivation that teachers do is mostly by saying it's okay to be curious about things that the teachers don't know about. And the teacher learn it with the children because there's so many new things uh, in the world. So I think that's the, the idea of autonomous learning. It's just a natural circumstance of human beings. I wonder how and when will we all be widespread in consumer electronic market? Does the government have any plan on this? Well, as a matter of fact, cardboard VR is now on sale on grocery stores. Uh, I, I saw one on 7-Eleven, I'm sure there's one in other Valley Mart or whatever, right? So it is already in consumer electronic market, it does, you don't have to wait. Uh, it's, it's just not very good quality, uh, and you don't get to bring your hands uh, into a cardboard, you have your eyes and yes. So to bring your hands in, that takes another um, I don't know, yeah, or so. And to bring the rest of your body in, that takes another year or so. So uh, the technology is advancing very quickly. And I think it depends on how many parts of your sensory organ can you bring in. There will be different applications. And of course, at some point, you will bring the feeling of body touch, of being cold and uh, hot, of smells and whatever in also. That's maybe five years or 10 years in the future. But at, at that point, it will then become possible to, to have a, a real empathy with somebody else's life uh, by living through their life in their, their own angle of viewpoint. And so the government's plan is basically by ensuring that everybody has equal access, that not just people in Taipei have access, and by making sure that we, the children grow up knowing that VR can be used as one of the tools for the job not that they have to work for any specific VR technology, because those get faded pretty fast. It's like the early uh, IBM PC, Apple II, or whatever, those personal computers, those get cycled really quickly. But the uh, design thinking, the computational thinking, those uh, still last. The civil servant has used the big data. 
Well, most civil servants don't have access to big data. Most of the data I work with is small data, meaning that data that fits on one computer. Uh, and, and that's what we work day to day. And, and I think there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's a lot of data science that can be done on small data. Um, the, the previous generation's data science, mostly based on statistics, requires a lot of the same formats data uh, on a very large volume in order to do any useful prediction. But nowadays, with machine learning and deep learning and, and AI, uh, it is now possible to use many different sort of data, but all small data, but still make useful predictions. Because now the machines teach itself. It doesn't need a human to train them. And it is a new development in just a, a couple of years now. So because of this, the whole science of big data is also changing to, uh, to accustom itself to the new demands of machine learning, of what we call multimodality, meaning like you're driving a car, you want your body to fit of where the car is. So when we're building a self-driving car, instead of having the big data on any particular part of the car, we use the whole car and even the street and even other cars uh, to generate data to inform the driving. So it is now the, the um, diversity of the data rather than the sheer volume of the data that is useful to machine learning. And this is one of the things that the civil servants, I hope, uh, can leverage by just automating any work in your daily work that anybody else do the same work, it will result in the same thing. This is what we call Rongshi, redundant work, because it doesn't really require your own judgment. And those parts are the parts that I think should be automated away as quickly as possible, even though it's just processing small data. Because even though it's small data, it's taking a lot of our time. Uh, and, and time is much more precious than hard disk space. So I think that is the, the first places that I will look to uh, automate away. Do you still read real work? What can you prefer? Is that will be disappearing by the digital world? Um, as a matter of fact, no, I mostly don't read paper books anymore. Um, I used, used to have paper books and I used this high-speed scanning machine just by using a, a knife to cut the binding. And then so it becomes a lot of paper and then feeding it to a high-speed scanner and then scan it to PDF and then recognize the characters. Because, because I rely on full text searching. I, I want to know where in the book does some word appear. And it's very hard to do so on paper. But paper is, of course, great because you can make annotations. You can do a lot of interesting on it. But now I can do so also with tablets and, and stylus. So I don't lose the benefit of paper, but I still get to do full text search. So the kind of book I prefer is the kind of book that I can search. Um, and where it would disappear by digital? I think this glass is still too heavy. Once it's become light enough and you can roll it up just like a piece of paper, that's when paper books is going to disappear. Because then any book is just a display and then you can change the content. And the technology is mostly already here. It's not just not massively produced. It will take a, another few years. But once we get there, I think people will embrace digital paper because they don't have to learn anything new. Dear Audrey, why is your English so fluent? Any tricks? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I listen to rap music and I rap along uh, with, with the rappers. And when you speak something very quickly, um, then when you speak slowly, it will appear as if you are very fluent. Uh, because your brain is used to speaking very quickly, and then the intonations and the uh, fluency, the flow will be, be right. So yeah, I'll listen to hip hop and rap uh, with the, the you know the rappers, the MCs. That actually really helps. Um, how many government sectors in the world use VR to deal with their daily work? Great question. Um, VR, consumer VR, is a really new technology. So it really is something that's still being evaluated. But for example, the HoloLens team is now partnering with a lot of governments just to, to make presentations more dynamic uh, by having interactive models. And that's one of the very normal day-to-day -day uses. And of course, the military and the NASA have used VR for many decades now. So. I think it's not about government sectors, it's about whether the current generation fits your use case. If it doesn't, 
don't rush to use VR. It will come in another few years. But if it does fit your use case, well, it's now true enough. So, so yeah, evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. Do you think if legislators are paid to give them this high salary or not? I don't actually know. Uh, I think it depends on the performance of the legislator. Um, if 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 they really need you know all this research and put this to good use, I think it's of course a good thing that they get to retain this many staff. Uh, I'm not you know envious of, of the, the legislators' pay. Uh, I think many legislators are really doing good and important policy work. But of course, it's not all legislators. So if some legislator you feel are not qualified for their salary, well, don't vote for them and campaign against them. Oh, now it's easy to recall a legislator too, so you can perhaps recall them. But uh, I mean, all, all this is, you know, dependent on the performance, and I, I think it's not um, wise to to talk broadly about all legislators. I'm sure many of them are doing uh, very important and focused work. Well, the only thing that doesn't get exponentially better is battery. So um, I get to switch to my phone here. Just a second. Actually, uh, Dr. Tsai was one of her main campaigning points, uh, and I support that completely. The, the most um, challenge thing that we, we discuss uh, when doing this uh, topic is the, the mindset of the older generations who still see a university degree as something that's, that's useful or required, why it really isn't if your interest is not in theoretical studying. Um, and so, yeah, the government does plan to change that. And uh, if, as a high school dropout and as someone who is entirely technological uh, in in the early teens uh, training, I am very willing to help uh, spreading the idea of a technological uh, education in high school is actually sometimes preferred for for many children. Um, was the policy on VR of the government in the near future? Well, um, first we try to tell people VR is not just for gaming. This is pretty 
uh, successful. Now people think VR and they think tourism, education, training, whatever. It's not a, just about games anymore. I think we, we really did get the message through. And the next uh, thing we're going to do here in Kaohsiung is to build a, a proof of concept of a, a VR park so that people can actually go here and participate in useful work, uh, like participating in a public hearing or whatever, uh, or trying out a new model of a car and simulate it, uh, things like this uh, here locally in Kaohsiung. Uh, once people have first-hand experience, especially legislators, once they have first-hand experience in doing this, then we talk about more applied uses of VR. But I think the first challenge we're going to solve in the next few years is just to get everybody first-hand experience. How do you think about the brain circulation, about the brain drain in Taiwan? Well, well I think um, well, it's about equality, right? If foreign talent visit Taiwan but really can't stay for long and has to reapply for every few uh, few months and doesn't you know only gets an ARC of something and for many systems they ask for an ID number and doesn't accept an ARC number uh, and for many uh, website it doesn't translate easily using Google Translate uh, and so on it really creates a lot of uh, issues about um, you know foreign talents working here. This is the question. Oh, really? Uh, let's change this one. Uh, let's wait a little bit. But I'm sure that it should. We need to make the foreign uh, talents enjoy equal treatment uh, better, while now they are massively disadvantaged. Uh, and I'm not saying about you know being very lucrative uh, offers to foreign talents or anything. It's just by preparing a work environment that lets them work uh, somewhat equally as local talents. I think that's the very basic thing we're needing to do. And the Foreign Talents Act, now in the legislation, are doing exactly that. And I hope the legislators do their deliberation on, on that uh, as soon as um, they, they would like. And then, uh, in your opinion, was the key point to reduce the digital gap between different spaces of different generations? I think one of the key points is that understanding that the digital transformation always happens locally, first at some place, is what we call the future is already here. It's not just evenly distributed yet. So we always see some local futures uh, trying different ways of life using new technology. And I think the key here is to let people know that it's, it's good, it's relaxed, it's comfortable enough to experiment with new technology without getting regulators saying, oh, you're breaking the law or something. And this is why we have the FinTech uh, Experimentation Act now also in the legislature's hands. Because if we can do that uh, experiment by breaking a few regulations just for six months or 12 months, then the whole society learns how the digital uh, technology works 
uh, as a whole society, not just a few people experimenting in one lab or something. So I, I really look forward for that happening. And if that works really well, then we are going to probably have also experimentation acts in other non-fintech sectors. And I think that um, society is for the better if we all learn about this in the public. What can we anticipate from the Asia linking to the Silicon Valley development project? Will AI or mobile payment domestic industry potentially or potentially boom? Well, the ASBDA is an independent agency. The government doesn't directly control them. It's mostly about linking to other Asian hubs and linking to the Silicon Valley in capital, in human resource, in regulation, harmonization, and things like that. So in short, it's not the digital minister's place to direct the ASBDA. The LSVDA, if they want some regulation change that deliberated, it's my job to, to talk with legislators and so on. But it's not the other way around. It's not Liang Zhao Shuangqing anymore. We're not talking to SVDA saying you need to promote those two industries and let others suffer. It's not like that. We just learn what people want to experiment and help them grow equally. So yeah, I don't do predictions, but we do process the technological impact on society as a society as, as they come. And we did this. While feeling frustrated and helpless, what suggestions are you suggesting confront those embarrassing situations? Usually I make music, or make poetry, or uh, sing, or listen to some, I don't know, sounds or something. Uh, that always helps. Um, and um, literature helps, going into nature helps. Uh, putting words, putting names to those feelings helps, uh, because then you're distancing yourself away. But more or less just, you know, distance at some point somewhat from your emotions, writing it down helps by keeping a room in your mind that is more than the emotions so that you can make informed decisions about the emotions and just watch it come and watch it go by because uh, your brain is where the emotion, you know, is like a guest, it visits you and then it leaves, but, but it's not, you're not defined uh, by your emotion. Uh, and a suggestion about protecting mobile phone and our PC home from a ransoming software. That's a great question. Well, use a Mac, but if you can't, uh, uh, if you have to use Windows, uh, then, then use Windows 10, which is self-updating. And uh, if you keep it self-updating, it actually makes most of ransom attacks um, go away. But if you're stuck with Windows XP or something, nobody can protect you. So yeah, that's, that's just turn out to update on. Can you please tell us how to learn by oneself, not by formal education system? Well, we covered that. It's covered in the uh, Experimentational Education Act, the Xian Jiao Yu San Fa. But mostly it's just look by looking for support groups who care about the same thing as you care about, and then learn from them, not from me, uh, because I don't really know what you care about. But uh, if you care about something, it's, there's always a community somewhere, um, you know elsewhere. How governments, public business, improve operation efficiency? Great question. Well, by automation, as I said, and by this intermediation. If you can talk with people directly, do it that way, not go through three or four intermediaries, because message get changed, gets blended that way. So this intermediation, automation, are always the way to improve efficiency, but also improve quality of life. I think VR has one of its primary use in distance learning, and, and this is why we're pushing for those basic um, high quality infrastructure, uh, fiber optic connections in all the basic school systems, because otherwise only some schools in large cities get access to those VR mediated learning, and many other schools will get stuck by watching YouTube videos, it's not fair. So as part of the infrastructure plan, uh, we're making sure that everybody has access to the infrastructure of that list. And information security protection need to be done when using VR in the public sector. Yeah, we, we need to use uh, government approved, penetration tested, uh, cyber security approved uh, protocol. There's quite a few ISOs uh, on this. So th this is not different from any other uh, video or recording equipment. There are standard protocols on this. And we do build our system on the government intranet or on the high net government region cloud which is a government-dedicated uh, internet backbone. I think that's all the questions, and um, yeah, we're, we're, we're even leaving some minutes for people who want to speak. Um, 
anyone who wants to practice your spoken English. Somehow. But if nothing, then we're going to stop right here. Thank you very much. Permission to come. Um, thanks, thanks for your excellent sharing. Let's give Commission and Town a big applause. Uh, 我们今天的活动就到此结束了谢谢您的参与敬请利用本学院艾伯拉蒂填写随堂问卷离开时记得你们的随身物品我们下次七月二十八日见晚安有人要到前面来拍照的吗<笑><笑>